Well, thank you very much. It's a great privilege and an honor to be here again. It's just always a great event, uh, and we always blaze new areas for discussion. There are always new things coming up, new technologies, new issues, uh, and a variety of things that always make this a very topical and interesting uh, conversation. Uh, Angus, can you start us off and, uh, and, and tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what you're focusing on? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Fossey, for inviting us here. And um, yeah, I represent, uh, in Hope, the International Association of Internet Hotlines which is an umbrella organization bringing together 51 organizations from 45 countries from around the world. The hotlines accept uh, the reports from the general public, so whoever by accident um, stumbles upon these resources can report to any hotline organization. Uh, but yeah, better maybe hotlines can, can talk about. That's a great intro for Stacy. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Stacy. I'm a research analyst from the Exploited Children Division, um, as Agnes said, from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NECMIC for short. Um, I'm pleased to be able to talk today about a new initiative um, within our department, which is to explore the cyber tip line reports in greater depth to try to see what kind of information that we can gather about um, online child exploitation. So as it was introduced. Um, so the reports are coming in primarily from internet companies um, as well as the public, as Agnes kind of elaborated on a little bit. Um, however, the primary initiative um, or the focus for the past year for us has been to focus on sextortion reports. So those um, types of reports that involve online enticement of children, but in which there's a blackmail component. So the suspect is using blackmail to coerce the child into providing sexual content, um, sometimes money, um, and in a small percentage to actually meet up face to face for sex. Um, so in this um, focus on sextortion, you know, it's certainly a timely focus given all of the sensationalized media cases that we've heard about sextortion lately. However, um, there's unfortunately very little if, if no research, um, especially empirical research on sextortion. So it's very difficult to know whether these sensationalized cases are actually reflective of the great range of sextortion cases that we're seeing um, among all children that are, are victimized by this type of exploitation. I'm from the Internet Watch Foundation, a small organization set up about 20 years ago in the UK, principally to run the UK or provide the UK hotline for public reporting of child sexual abuse material on the internet. Um, our, our sort of core mission is to remove such material by uh, asking the ISPs to take it down or where that's not possible by blocking it. Um, and we run the, what's known as a, a blocking list of URLs which is issued twice a day uh, and has typically two to 3,000 URLs on it, changing all the time, of course. The second initiative, um, which is very much a 2015 one, is that we're now using uh, the photo DNA technique, I think MD5 technology as well, to hash images as we, uh, well, both as we find them, and also we've been asked by the Home Office in the UK to uh, go through the, as it were, the um, historic database that the police hold of images that they've seized. Um, the, uh, we're in partnership with uh, five, preliminarily, uh, we're in partnership with five of the big industry players, including Google and Microsoft, uh, and we expect that to expand as we get the thing going. Hi everyone, I'm Kate. Um, I work at Google here in DC on youth and technology policy issues. Um, as I'm sure you all know, Google was built on the idea that technology can be used to solve some of the world's greatest challenges. And I think we probably all agree in this room that there's few more worthy causes on fighting child exploitation and human trafficking and activity like that. Um, that's why Google has been so involved in the space and we've worked with pretty much everyone here on this stage in the, in the past and will continue to going forward to see what we can do to kind of solve this problem. Um, and I think the final thing that we've touched on so far is making people aware of what um, is available online um, for, for law enforcement to use, for organizations to use, to kind of make sure this content isn't appearing. 
I'm Steve Seitz, and I actually handle the internal policies for privacy and online safety at Microsoft. And I like to joke that Microsoft is a startup, um, but in some ways, when you talk about these issues, they really are always new. There's always something going on. Um, we've been involved in online safety for well over 20 years, and we cannot not be involved. It, you know, this is a problem that's been around for a few years now. When we had these conferences a few years ago, one of the keys seemed to be capacity building. People just didn't know about it, didn't know how to deal with it. It was all new. Parents didn't know how to deal with it because they're always the concern that their kids knew more than they did, which was sort of reflected in some of the materials. Law enforcement was clueless, largely. They didn't really, they knew there were problems but didn't know how to do it. Uh, so Richard, you mentioned that your organization's been around for about 20 years now working on these things. Are you finding that capacity building is one of the key issues here? Or is it that, in fact, people are starting to get a better handle on it and it's more a question of information flow? I think um, capacity in terms of uh, law enforcement has improved significantly in the UK. It's, it's got some way to go. And the part of the problem, of course, is that the police feel themselves um, almost overwhelmed by the volume of material. Um, but it is all the, the kind of joining up of relationships is all getting better, as indeed our relationships with industry players who are you know, really very um, ready to come forward and to help and support with new initiatives. And, and the sort of stuff we're doing now is clearly going to be very helpful. But I think, you know, I mean, we're part of the, the kind of prevention bit of all of this, really, where uh, the, the, the question of public awareness and so on is, I mean, we do run some public awareness campaigns, but it's almost too big for us as a small organization. These are things that need to be taken on by by government and industry, I think. Wow. Very good. Stacey, you know, in terms of the research that you've been doing and so forth, are you seeing a change in the nature of these issues in terms of both the ability of whether it's law enforcement or parents to deal with it or the nature of, of the, the problem itself? Um, I don't know if in our research I have the ability to say whether it's actually changing or how so it's changing. Um, my hopes is that it is. Um, I think that with uh, awareness raising and just in terms of how sextortion specifically is occurring. Um, so to give one example, um, in our data we see that sometimes sextortion does occur on one particular internet platform or another. So it's kind of just all housed on that one place. They encounter the child, the sextortion occurs there, and that whole incident essentially wraps up never having moved to another platform. But in a very large um, percentage of reports, we do see that they're happening across multiple platforms. So the child and a suspect may be meeting somewhere online, um, but then they're being pushed onto other um, platforms, essentially, um, I would imagine, so that suspects can get content more easily and anonymously from children. Um, <coughs> so where they're initially encountering them is not necessarily where the actual blackmail is occurring, and then it's not where um, the suspect is essentially threatening them to say, if you don't continue doing what I want you to do, um, then I'm going to continue um, posting this online, uh, making other threats against you and that sort of thing. I think the takeaway here is just that um, with awareness raising about, um, with just one small thing about sextortion is that it's not necessarily just occurring in one place. Now when we try to put this information out to parents, the children themselves, law enforcement, I would hope that um, they would take this information and just have a better understanding of, of this one particular thing among a lot of our other findings as well. Just that you may need to be looking in more than one place. Or for parents, if you're monitoring your children's accounts, that if they've met somebody on a social networking site and everything seems to look fine, that that may not necessarily be where um, the kind of dirtier stuff is going on, the kind of questionable stuff, that um, they may have actually gotten your child to move on to a different platform and is communicating with them um, on, on there, essentially. What is it that people out here should take away from the research in terms of what is it that should be done? Um, I would definitely say report as soon as possible um, when you get the sense that something like sextortion may be occurring. Um, the minute that you, you notice something uncomfortable, the minute that you become blackmailed, um, just because sometimes these offenders will take somewhat relatively innocent images, you know, not, not completely innocent, but if a, ch if a girl is in her bra, for example, and then that situation will escalate all the way sometimes to very extreme situations where um, the, the suspect is asking for directed video of the child, so just really kind of horrific things. Um, and so especially when the goal seems to be content, that the person wants more and more content, that's not just, you know, give me a, a couple more pictures like the ones I already have. It's increasingly more explicit. Um, again, sometimes moving from images to video, sometimes trying to demand that the child offend upon other children in their life, such as siblings or friends. And so it's not gonna end. Thinking that you can handle it 
is, is likely not true, um, that this person has ulterior motives, has other objectives, and they're just going to continue pushing and pushing and pushing, blackmailing and coercing the child um, for however long, however long that they deem that they want to. Um, so reporting it as soon as possible, again, not feeling like you can necessarily handle it yourself, reporting it to a parent, reporting it to NECMIC, reporting it to law enforcement um, is probably the biggest takeaway that I would see because I've read too many reports where these situations just escalate so quickly and so out of control and it's just really horrific. Now, for, so, so, um, sorry. Rick, well, I was just going to say, I mean, we have to always remember in this, uh, in the, the bit that we deal with, that of course pedophilia predates the internet by a long way, uh, and there's always been a very significant and serious problem. And it was, you know, the internet obviously, as in many other areas, offers an opportunity for much more volume, much quicker, much easier, and all of those things, but it doesn't change the, the basic you know, problem. One of the things that we're very interested in, and maybe people in the audience who can offer something on this, is the extent to which there is a crossover between viewing child sexual abuse material and committing um, offences against children. And you know, I think we, we, you come across um, individual cases where it looks as if that's what's happened, but I think there's not a lot of research evidence about it. Very interesting. Kate, you look like you wanted to jump in with that. Yeah, I was, I was thinking because um, for thousands of queries on Google, we have a warning um, for queries related to this type of content. We have a warning that pops up. And you know, I'm, when we did it, we weren't sure how effective, right? How effective is deterrence, right? If someone is looking for this content, is a warning going to stop them? And we actually found that there was a drop-off rate in click-through, that the warnings are really working, yeah. maybe not yeah. for everyone, yeah. but they are having an effect. And I think that's the great part about the work that Microsoft's doing, the work that we're yeah. doing with all of you, is trying to think of new and creative ways to work on deterrence, working on removing this material, um, work on removing it before it's even reposted. The hashing system yeah. is, is super important for that. Yeah. And I think collaboration is what is allowing um, the group of people fighting this to kind of take on the new challenges that we're facing every day in this space. Steve? Yeah, we too offer um, uh, on, on the Bing search uh, basically a public service announcement. So if someone is looking for this material, yeah. They get a big warning sign. This is illegal material. I mean, I, you know, I think the other thing that we need to recognize here is that there's lots of discussions about content on the internet. Mm -hmm. This is toxic. This is abhorrent content. And I think we should recognize that not only do we have a business interest, but we also have a role here to, to, to really inform people who they'll go looking for it. Hey, look, you are going down a path that is universally viewed as the worst thing you can possibly do. And I think that's an important thing to kind of br bring forward here. I think uh, ending our panel on an optimistic note that there are tools and new things coming to enable helping parents, helping schools, helping the community, helping all of us is a good way to end it. Let us give this great panel some applause. <laughs>